Welcome back, Dad. This is Podcast 36, as we continue on uh, Jesus Teaches on Christology. So uh, before we get started, we just got through the Easter season. It was wonderful. Absolutely. I know the church. It really had a good time, Good a whole whole Holy Week. Um, good Friday, and mm. Palm Sunday, starting with Palm Sunday, Good Friday. And Absolutely. Then Easter was wonderful. So... Uh, any thoughts you want to share with us before we get started here? Glad to be back. It was uh, good to focus on uh, the resurrection of Christ. You know, we we work through the sufferings of Christ, and it really is. I, I think for us, it's, it's difficult because we're working through the passages we're going to teach, and we enter in, and it's so awesome to get to that Sunday and just to focus totally upon Jesus's conquering of death and just what that means to us, and it gives us that living hope. I know it was a wonderful time. Amen. So, this episode today uh, picks up right where we left off in our last one. So, if you need context for this episode, go back to episode 35, mm -hmm. where Jesus did part one on Christology. Yeah. And it's a very tense situation. Mm -hmm. um, the religious leaders are plotting to murder Jesus, and they're accusing him of breaking the law of Moses mm -hmm. by healing a man on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. So... Jesus will reveal their hardened hearts, and he'll point to numerous witnesses who identify him as Messiah and the Son of God. And he's going to expose the religious leaders' um, exclusive good old boys club, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> where members give praise and glory to each other yeah. rather than seeking God's glory. That's very prevalent today. Yeah, You kind of have the in crowd, and uh, they don't want to accept anyone else. It's just all, they all work together. We all praise each other, mm -hmm. and if someone wants to do ministry or do something, we kind of push them away. Yeah. So Jesus will demonstrate that rejecting him also means rejecting the Father as well as the law and the prophets. Mm. So there's some, there's some pretty heavy things in this podcast. Absolutely. So I think we'll get right to it. This is Podcast 36, Jesus Teaches on Christology, His Witness and Glory, which is taken from John 5, 31. Through 47. Mm. I'm Pastor Kenny Bird Jr., an associate pastor, Comer Rainer Bible Church, and creator of Theology for Everyday Life for Kids. And I'm joined by my father. Why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is uh, Ken Bird. <laughs> I'm the senior pastor of the Comer Rainer Bible Church, and I've been in this role for 33 years now, coming up on June. Yeah. So it's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just get right to the text and see what Jesus is going to say. So Jesus says in verse 31, if I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. Uh, Jesus knows God's law, and in the law, no one could be executed without two or three witnesses, which I think is really interesting. We see in Deuteronomy 17.6, the one condemned to die is to be executed on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Mm. No one is to be executed on the testimony of a single witness. So Jesus is making the point, hey, I'm just not saying I am the Son of God, the Messiah. Right. There are others who are pointing to that and making these claims. Yeah, these hypocrites uh, are trying to trip Jesus up, saying he's a contradiction, he doesn't match the Scripture, and yet in reality, uh, Jesus trips them up. Uh, because he shows how they are not consistent. And by the way, the statement here, if I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. This is not a contradiction uh, to John 8, 14, because there Jesus says, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. He was just referring to his own nature. He's truth. I mean, if he says anything, it's got to be accurate. Uh, so here it's, as you pointed out from Deuteronomy 17, he's turning to the law to show the official a way to give testimony. Yeah. And I mean, that makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. And I think the context too is they're trying to kill him here. Absolutely. So he's kind of saying at the same point, a little jab, like you can't convict me of anything. Yeah. And then verse 32, there is another who testifies about me. Mm -hmm. And I know the testimony he has given about me is true. And I, I would assume it would seem from studying the text that he's speaking about uh, God the Father. It could be in the generic sense that all Jesus has done, but he did speak specifically at his baptism, mm -hmm. and he's going to speak even more in the future. So in Matthew 3, 17, the father said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. 
That's a lot right there. Absolutely. And then uh, Jesus will also point out that John the baptizer testified about his identity. Mm -hmm. John said in John 1, and this is John 1, 32 through 34, and John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove. Mm -hmm. So you even see the Holy Spirit. That's right. And he rested on him. I didn't know him. And that's one thing I point out in my kids' curriculum real quick, is John didn't seem to know the identity of Jesus. Oh. He knew Jesus was a very good person, yeah. but he said, I didn't know who the Messiah was. But he who sent me to baptize with water told me, the one you see the Spirit descending and resting on, he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Yeah. So John, with a very popular following, is also saying, hey, I saw that too, and Jesus is the Son of God. And then we have in verse 33, you sent messengers to John and he testified to the truth. So not only that, but they sent, as we both know, those priests and religious people to investigate John. And John told them that Jesus is the Lamb of God. And at that point it was, he was saying there's one, you know, who I'm not even worthy to untie his sandal strap. Mm -hmm. And we see from John 1, 6 through 9, John the Apostle writes, mm -hmm. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. There are a lot of witnesses in our account uh, you went back to uh, 32, there is another who testifies. The word another, uh, sometimes it's just a synonym. There is alas and heteros. Sometimes they're just synonyms. But at times as well, they are used to show a distinction. Alas can be used another of the same kind. So it does make sense, just what you said. There is another who testifies about me, the witness of the Father. But then you come down to verse 33, uh, Jesus says, you sent messengers to John, and he testified to the truth. And I just want to point out, this book is all about testimony. Uh, when I did a word search, the noun for witness or to testify uh, was used 14 times, and the verb 33, in other words, 47 times, <laughs> the idea of a witness or testimony, which fits into the theme that these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. A whole lot of testimony from the greatest uh, impeachable of sources. And then Jesus will go on to say, I don't receive human testimony, yeah. but I say these things so you may be saved. Jesus didn't need John to verify exactly. his identity. It's not like Jesus unbecame the Messiah. <laughs> That's right. To coin a term, if, if all of a sudden John didn't identify him. Mm. But God the Father and God the Holy Spirit were testimony enough, yet Jesus told the people the truth yeah. so they would believe and be saved, and this was the Father's will. So he didn't need necessarily John's testimony, but obviously he still received it, but it wasn't necessary for him to be Messiah. <laughs> exactly. And he says, John was a burning and shining lamp, mm. and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. Some... We would think some of the Pharisees, at least they're there, mm -hmm. and priests, it said many people believed in him. That's right. So it's possible that some of them believed his message, not the majority. But however, Jesus is going to make the point that he is greater than John. And we always see this imagery in the Bible, the shining lamp, the light, mm -hmm. um, how important it is to shine it for God. And you have John the Baptist. And it is interesting, the wording Jesus uses, he was a shining lamp. He's a lamp, but he's not the light of the world. Uh, and there's a distinction. And John was ever so quick to point this out. He kept pointing people to Jesus. I mean, in John 1, they kept interrogating him. Are you, are you the Messiah? And he, and he gets briefer each time. <laughs> Basically says no uh, to conclude it. But he's a lamp, and John was a marvelous lamp. But he's just pointing us to the light of the world. And we're going to see, because it's going to come in a little bit to the good old boys club, we're giving yeah. glory to each other, Yes. where John is the example, because he doesn't take glory upon himself. He yeah. points to Jesus. Mm. And here he says in verse 36, but I have a greater testimony than John's because of the work that the Father has given me to accomplish. These very works I am doing, testifying about me that the Father has sent me. Mm-hmm. 
So what are these miracles he's speaking of? I think in this context, he's already done a lot of miracles, Yes, but it's probably his past miracle that he just did Mm -hmm. of healing the man at the pool, Yeah, and they're trying to kill him because of that. (laughs) Wonderful. So um, (laughs) we have to remember the religious leaders want to kill Jesus because he uh, performed a miracle on the Sabbath. So Jesus is basically saying, hey, I'm greater than John because God the Father gave me these miracles to perform. Mm-hmm. Yet you guys are still trying to kill me for carrying out my father's work. Yeah. And that's important to remember. John never did a miracle, not that we see. That's right. Yet uh, the people called him a great prophet. So Jesus' works included his teaching and miracles, which were much greater than John and his ministry. So I want to draw your attention just to this argument that Jesus is about to lay out. Mm-hmm. Um, he wants to point out that these religious leaders are not saved. They don't know God, mm-hmm. and they have hard hearts. Yeah, and um, because of these hard hearts, they want to kill Jesus. Mm-hmm. And I think it's important to understand what a hard heart is. Yeah. A hardened heart is you believe something, and then you just become hardened in that aspect. Mm-hmm. Um, even when we look at the hardening of Pharaoh, yeah, basically the Pharaoh's will was, "I need to stop these Jewish people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I need mm-hmm. to oppress them." Yeah. And then God said, okay, you want to be hard. I can make you even harder. Exactly. And uh, it's not the idea that God, you know, takes soft hearts Mm -hmm. and says, I'm going to make you do the opposite. So Jesus is just saying, hey, your hearts are already super hard. Mm -hmm. So here's the five things um, that they won't do. Um, Number one, they don't have God's word inside of them. Thus, they reject the one he sent. Logical. Mm-hmm. They don't understand scripture and how it points to Jesus as the Messiah. They are too proud to accept Jesus, proving the love of God is not in them. They will accept false prophets, but not the prophet. They do not believe Moses' words, so they will not believe Jesus' words. Mm-hmm. Boy, how angry must have they have gotten. Because yeah. <laughs> they love Moses. You know. And Peter picks up on this, you know, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 22, he's standing up, recognizing that the nation had rejected their Messiah, slaughtered a king, and he says, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you. In other words, what more did you need? I mean, how many more miracles did you need? Attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. They knew these things, and they still butchered the Messiah. So they're about their own agenda, and it's a pathetic thing. I always yeah. think of when, before Jesus dies, and all the people are debating, and then one, they, some say, he's not the Messiah, but then some say, well, will the Messiah do more than this man? Yeah, <laughs> like, I this know. man is, like, what, what more want? can he do? He yeah, raises right. the dead, he heals the sick, yeah. teaches with authority. So as we roll to verse 37, yeah. the Father who sent me has himself testified about me. You have not heard his voice at any time, mm-hmm. and you haven't seen his form. You don't have his word residing in you because you don't believe the one he sent. So this is really a swipe, the religious hypocrites. Uh, They claim to be holy and righteous, yet they have never heard God's voice or seen his form at any time. Mm. Think of it, Moses had Mm -hmm. at least heard his voice, seen something when he passed by. However, God's eternal son stood before them who had had perfect fellowship with God for all of eternity. Jesus had both seen the Father and heard his voice. After all, Jesus is the word of God. That's right. Yet these people rejected him. If these people believed God's word, they would accept his son. Mm -hmm. These people have rejected God's son, and in doing so, they have rejected God, the Father. So, you know, they weren't drawn by the Father in that aspect because they rejected him. (laughs) So they want to go to the son. It's really sad. And there is such a tremendous witness. I mean, even to the Father, to the Son, uh, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, Matthew 3, 17. Later at 17, 5 at the transfiguration, same words, but hear him. And then this plethora of miracles. And we only have select miracles because John goes, you know, no book could contain all that Jesus had done. Three so he's years. chosen. 
Yeah. So, I mean, they even knew of others that you and I do not know about today and still rejected him. And that was the father's witness. And we're going to see even later with the transfiguration that both Moses and Elijah appear, which even points to that witness. Exactly. That you have the law symbolized in the law and the prophets. That's right. You know, confirming Jesus. Yeah. Now, this is such a fascinating verse here in verse 39. Mm -hmm. It says, you pour over the scriptures because you think you have eternal life in them, and yet they testify about me. We have to understand these men studied the scripture day and night and thought they were saved through it, yet they totally missed the parts of the law and prophets which point to Jesus. They were relying on their good works to save them. Yeah. And how many people do we have today? Mm. Um, I think of people who dedicate their whole life in monasteries and places, all studying the scripture, yeah. but yet they're not saved because they're adding to salvation or they truly miss who Jesus is or his saving grace. Mm-hmm. So how many people today are caught up in studying scripture and miss the point of scripture itself, revealing God's plan of salvation? Many. Uh, I was brought up on a King James Version, and verse 39 says, search the scripture in a sense of a command. And the ending of the verb can either be an imperative, as the King James took it to search, or an indicative, just making a statement. It doesn't make sense where Jesus would be telling them to do this. They already already done this. They had thoroughly um, gone through the scriptures and have missed a point of the scriptures. And Romans 10, 4 just always jumps out. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And I've mentioned to you before and to others, when you look at Romans 10, 4, the first word in the Greek sentence is end because it's the emphasis that the law takes you to Christ. These individuals searched it and totally miss the entire intent of the law. He was standing before them. And that's Hebrews. Yeah. <laughs> the book of Hebrews makes that point. Uh, and uh, Romans, yeah. and much more. Mm-hmm. But they, they miss it. They miss it. And how many people today, I think a lot of people too, as a side note, they view the Bible as, I don't know, a, a mm-hmm. debating text, yeah. a uh, yeah. thing to study. I, I see so much on uh, YouTube and podcasts. It's just worthless. Mm-hmm. Just bickering. Yeah, and it's it's like you people are missing it. You mm-hmm. don't understand what it's all about. Mm-hmm. Um, and verse forty says, "But mm-hmm. you were not willing to come to me, so that you may have life." So it's important to see verse thirty nine and forty together. It says they search the scriptures for eternal life, mm-hmm. but yet they won't come to Jesus, who gives eternal life. Exactly. So these people are arrogant. Mm-hmm. And they are too proud to accept Jesus and his message. Mm. Um, so they go to the scripture, scripture points to Jesus, but they're not willing to come to Jesus. Therefore, they won't have eternal life. The very thing that should have broken them, the elevated word of God, is the very thing that they find pride in because they made it an academic exercise instead of as the law was given and everybody's going, oh, Moses, why don't you just go talk to God? Because they were petrified. Jesus is teaching at the Sermon on the Mount. He's on the Mount. The Word of God, what does it do? It breaks people. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Totally what should have happened didn't happen because they were all about themselves. And and that's one kind of role I have with preachers and teachers. I don't listen to them if they're arrogant. Mm -hmm. Because I just think that reveals your heart Mm -hmm. if you're an arrogant and haughty type of person. Because I don't think you're close to God. Right. So verse 41, I do not accept glory from people, but I know you, that you have no love for God within you. Mm. This is a very important point Mm. for Christians to understand today. Unlike the religious leaders in Jesus' day, he was not out for personal glory. After all, he always cried, not my will, but yours be done. Notice that it's the Father who always glorified Jesus. Jesus never glorified himself. Great point. Mm-hmm. We're tasked with imitating Jesus, serving the Father, and allowing Him to glorify us if He desires. A self-glorification should never be our aim. Mm-hmm. However, these religious leaders simply desired glory for themselves, and this showed that their religion was fake, and they truly did not love the Father. 
they love the glory and not the father of glory. Mm. And I think of this like with reward shows and all those types of things. I mean, mm. I, I don't watch Oscars or Emmys, they're trash. But the whole idea that a bunch of people get together and they're like, here's a trophy, here's a reward. And Christians do that. Yeah. We get, here's a reward, here's this. And it's like the old, I call it the good old boys club. Yeah. <laughs> It's let me scratch your back and you scratch mine and we'll all feel good about each other. And we're not really serving God. We're just kind of all seeing how much we can one up each other for glory. And that's these people. And when Jesus makes the statement, but I know you, (laughs) you have to step back and go, I mean, who has the ability to look into someone's heart and really discern the motives. We don't even know where that information lies in the individual, to be quite honest with you. So he knows it by omniscience, but he also knows when he says you don't have the love of God in you by experience, because they're trying to kill him him, after all. (laughs) So he knows it both because of who he is, you know, his omniscience and his personal experience with them. Yeah. So they love the glory, but they they don't love the Father's glory. Mm -hmm. So... Jesus says in verse 43, I have come in my Father's name, and yet you don't accept me. Mm -hmm. If someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him, speaking of each other. Mm -hmm. Jesus had many witnesses, the Father, the Holy Spirit, John, the Mm -hmm. prophets, the Mm -hmm. law, Scripture itself, that testified that he is the Son of God and Messiah, yet the religious community will not accept him. Mm -hmm. I think it's really with the sarcastic tone Jesus suggests that they would gladly accept the witness of a false teacher or prophet who glorify themselves and yet have no witnesses. Yeah. And I think he's really referring to them. Yeah. You accept each other, yet you don't even love God. Showing again how they are a contradiction because Jesus is saying, okay, you want to appeal to the law? Here are the multiple witnesses that say, I'm God. But then he makes the appeal uh, to the law uh, showing how you were to test a prophet, they weren't even using the standards from the Old Testament because it would have clearly shown them that Jesus was like the prophet of old, a deliverer and a spokesman for God. Yeah. And like I said, we have to be very careful in the church not to be that good old boys club. Yeah, <laughs> true. You know, because I, I, I just see that as a real problem mm-hmm. where we're not just all working together for the glory of God. Yeah. Verse 44, how can you believe, implying they can't, Mm -hmm. since you accept glory from one another, but don't seek the glory that comes from the only God? Mm. They accept and praise each other, yet do not seek true glory, which comes from honoring God and his word. Um, I think this is all pointing back to the miracle. Jesus does this great thing, heals this man, and then they're angry at him where God is happy with it, the Father. Mm -hmm. They won't believe in Jesus because they are self-seeking and do not seek glory from God. Yeah. So a lot of them, they just cared about their politics and where they stood. That's it. And then he says in verse uh, 45, do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom you have set your hope. Mm. When I was studying that, it's their hope isn't in the Father. And his goodness, their hope is in Moses and his law, yeah. which they misinterpret. Exactly. So these people, deceived by their self-righteousness, mm-hmm. thought they were honoring Moses and would mm-hmm. be saved by doing good deeds and following the law. At this point, I don't think it's even intentions, because what do I mean by that? I think people are so deceived that they think they have good intentions. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like Paul. He's out killing, or at least prisoning, imprisoning Christians. Mm-hmm. And he really thinks he's doing something good. But who right. cares if what you're doing is morally wrong? Exactly. And I think these people truly thought they were shutting up a rebel in Jesus. Yeah. But they had just totally missed the boat. Yet Jesus said that Moses himself will condemn them. Mm-hmm. And uh, teaching through all the words of Jesus, we see at the final judgment, the unsaved will be accused by the righteous. And this is a theology I never really even thought mm-hmm. about or doctrine. Mm-hmm. And that we see the people in Nineveh. Yeah. And the Queen of Sheba will condemn yeah. the religious hypocrites in Matthew 12. Mm. And we see throughout Scripture uh, the towns of Sodom and Gomorrah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. wicked. They'll condemn. Um, we see like Capernaum, Nazareth, those cities. And it looks like Moses himself will somehow stand up and condemn this generation. Yeah. So their hope was found in the words of Moses, whereas Moses was ultimately pointing to Jesus, the Messiah. Yeah. I don't think he fully understood it. 
mm-hmm. but he was inspired and he talked to the prophet who would come. Right. So, for if you believe Moses, you would believe me because he wrote about me. Mm-hmm. Moses wrote about the future prophet who would be like him. <laughs> Jesus is saying that they truly did not believe Moses because if they did, they would accept Jesus as Messiah. So I did some research and I ran across the Deuteronomy 18, 18 through 19. Mm-hmm. And this is what God tells Moses. They're talking about false teachers and good teachers. This mm-hmm. is where we get the whole thing. If you're a false prophet, you need to stone them. Yeah. Um, and that could be a whole other debate. Today, we have so many people who claim they have words from God that don't come true. Yeah. Like, should we take you outside? Thankfully, we're not under the law. That's right. <laughs> Kill them. Yeah, but, that's right. Um, which are not for violence, but just the point being so many people say, I have a word from God. And then mm-hmm. they're totally wrong. It's like, no, you didn't. Right. But uh, verse 18, I will rise up for them, Israel, a mm-hmm. prophet like you, Moses, from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I command him. Mm-hmm. I will hold accountable whoever does not listen to my words that he speaks in my name. Mm-hmm. That's almost you know, 2,000 years less, right. but uh, before uh, Jesus became a man and had this account. So these people will be held accountable for not recognizing Jesus. Yeah, for if you believe Moses, the second class condition assumes the statement not to be true. So he's saying you didn't believe Moses. And Moses was a great standard. Uh, you recall the story, and we'll be getting this somewhere down the pike, in Luke 16 with the rich man and Lazarus. And the rich man wants, uh, you know, someone who's been risen from the dead uh, to show up on the scene so the brothers can be evangelized. And, and the statement is they have Moses and the prophets. So Moses is quite the standard uh, that is given, and they truly don't believe him. And we have to point out many in Israel were saved yeah. because they understood mm-hmm. Moses' words and yeah. saw how it did point to Jesus. And that's why later Paul, Peter, and all them yeah. They'll convert many people using the Old Testament scripture. That's right. Because when people are honest, they could say, hey, it, truly Jesus is Messiah. Yeah. And then he's going to end on verse 47. But if you don't believe what he wrote, how will you believe my words? Right. So we have to remember the religious leaders want to kill Jesus. Mm-hmm. They rejected Moses' witness, John's witness, the Holy Spirit's witness, the Father's witness. So they won't believe Jesus. That's right. And after saying these words, just, Jesus just left. You mm-hmm. see, he just crosses to the other side. He yeah. gets out of there. Yeah. Um, before we look at our employment, anything you want to add? or No, go, go right ahead with okay. the employment. Looking forward to them. Yeah, so mm-hmm. just see the nature. Yeah. So we just have two simple points, employment. So many witnesses testified about Jesus's identity. Mm-hmm. The religious leaders should have accepted Jesus as Messiah based on the many witnesses who correctly identified him. Exactly. And we're not even talking about all the people who saw his miracles. Mm-hmm. Um, the man who's healed of leprosy, who right. goes presents himself. Yeah. There, there's all these people who know, but the witnesses just that this text is kind of looking at is John the Baptist, Old Testament prophets, Moses and the law, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and Jesus's words and miracles. Mm-hmm. A lot of testimony. A lot there. of testimony. Question to ask yourself, since I've accepted that Jesus is the Messiah, if you do, do I honor him in my words and works and thoughts? Can I use scripture to prove that Jesus is the Messiah and Son of God? Mm -hmm. What verses would I use in the Old Testament to testify to Jesus' true identity? I I think that's important that Christians understand and can even use the Old Testament to point people to Jesus as the Messiah. When we meet someone of the Jewish religion and they want to know what we believe and cut off the New Testament since they don't believe it, what can we do with the Old Testament? We should be able to make a very strong case from the Old Testament pointing to who Jesus is. And I think that's something that Christians should bone up on and and be good at. So that's many witnesses testified about Jesus' identity. Yeah. And this is looking at Christology because they're truly saying he's Christ. Exactly. <laughs> and then two, and this is the one we have to be careful with. First, we'll look at the point and then understand how it can apply to us. Mm-hmm. The Pharisees sought glory apart from God, which revealed their wicked hearts. Yeah. The Pharisees and religious leaders looked righteous on the outside, 
Yet on the inside, they were filthy because they rejected God and his plan of salvation. Their righteousness was found in the good old boys club in which they glorified each other while not seeking true glory, which comes from God the Father. That's a lot of churches in America summed up right there. That's right. Good old boys club. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, you might be a church where you have wise leadership, and you have to be careful with who obviously they let teach on your board. So we're not we're not saying that, but we're talking about how I scratch your back, you scratch mine, right. and we don't have. Uh, we're we're truly not seeking to glorify the Father. That's right. We might think we are, mm -hmm. but we're truly just trying to glorify ourselves. Mm. Questions okay. I need to ask myself. Does my faith revolve around impressing others with my self-righteous deeds, or do I seek to glorify the, and honor the Father? Thoughts. Have I fully embraced God's truth while shunning the empty praises and false glory given to me by other men? Mm -hmm. Do my actions honestly reflect my love for Christ, or do they merely reveal a desire for personal fame, exposing me as a hypocrite? Mm. There, there's a lot of application that can be there. I think we all have to be careful. You know, you look at our, if you have a YouTube ministry, you can get caught up in numbers. Yeah. It's very easy. Comments where, you know, a lot of times we just have to put the seed out there. That's we right. engage with people, but we don't try to get impressed. Well, I wish, you know, I had as many followers as this guy. That's or, right. you know, I wish I spoke like this guy. Yeah. Um, because we all have our special ministry. Um, that was podcast 36, Jesus Teaches on Christology, His Witness and Glory, which was taken from John 5, 31 through 47. I kind of cut you off there if you want to add anything there with the end. But, uh, no, I, but I, you know, just a little personal testimony. Yeah. It's all about us making disciples today. And, you know, I came to you with my bird and we want to start a foundation. But you have to determine when you do that, the disciples you're going to make. And I, we, we've talked about sometimes there are open doors and other times closed doors. Paul tried to go into certain places in Asia and the Spirit of God shut him down. Then he gets this vision from a man of Macedonia saying, come over to help me, and actually goes to Philippi and plants the first church in Europe. God has given us an open door with the Philippines. You know, we're doing the firehouse with Fel and Chali, or missionaries in the Kabayag region. But... I've been praying the last week or so and saying, Lord, I've got all these extra preaching books that have been donated. Where do they need to go? I hear from a pastor in the Philippines, totally different region by Manila, and he teaches homiletics over at the Word of Life. And it was just like, there you go. It's, it's the example. And so obediently, you know, we just sent out the, uh, the books. The books were donated, 500 hours worth of training books with preaching. And $121 was the amount to send them to the Philippines. And then, lo and behold, that was done yesterday. Today, um, I look, and from our PayPal account, someone is monthly now going to give us $150. And, you know, I just want to encourage the folks that just do and, and spread the seed, be a witness, be a testimony, and God will confirm you in what you're doing. And just stick with the truth. You have it. It's our job now to get it out. And that's why we're doing our, our podcast. We just want people to know the truth, not to think any more highly of us. We're just two guys stumbling through this together, but just to really understand the great God we have and the witnesses that testify to Jesus. And never use us just as like your main source. <laughs> yeah. Always say, okay, this is what they say, and then check it with scripture, because I see that so often now. Arthur said this, or Piper. It's like, who cares? Yeah. What yeah. does God's word say? Exactly. Amen. So they're a shepherd who can point you places, but it's like, yeah. okay, now let's see. Exactly. And I would give a word of wisdom. Uh, uh, we are we're interested in disciples who want to grow. Yeah. Um, how many people do we have contact us asking us for money? Yeah. Saying, do this, do that, do this. And yeah. it's like, no. <laughs> right. So if you're contacting us, first of all, uh, we wish we made more money. <laughs> yeah. You know, we're, not, we're not filthy rich. Um, and it's just one of those things with ministry. A lot of people kind of see you as a cow to be milked. Yeah. Where it's like, if your contact is asked for money, it's like, sorry, yeah. you know, we take care of our church. Mm -hmm. We take care of our own and do the best we can. But I mean, we're, we're a small church. That's we, right. we don't have big funds. You're talking a hundred and some people maybe on a Sunday. Yeah. And so it's not some big, massive, you right. know, 5,000 people. So if you are contacting us and you ask us for money, you'll get a kind response to in the end saying no. Yeah. But we're looking for people who want to work, want to do the ministry and really care about spreading the gospel. Amen.
about it because that's what it comes down to. Um, anything personally you want to share real quick before? Or? I'm just um, concurring with you 100%. I tell all my contacts up front, you know, we're in ministry to give you training and it's not about the money because that's not what we can give to you, but we can help you through our podcast. We got hundreds of sermons. We have now 12 books. Uh, you do an animated series for uh, on the life of Jesus, and they're, but they're all free. And we want to, and it's, it's interesting how many people just immediately turn you off because it's not the money. And it's just like, but then we get those rare gems that just want to work the truth. They want to know and benefit by what we've been privileged to learn. And they're, they're the gems. They're the Peter, James, and Johns that, you know, Jesus takes and invests in them. And that's what we need to look for. Well, I try to give the example now that, uh, California, they passed their new law with uh, fast food workers. Yeah. And it's like, these people are making minimum wage and making almost more than <laughs> they are, I think, making more money than I make. Yeah. But yet, like my ministry with the kids' uh, curriculum, it's all free. Yeah. I, don't, I don't charge for it. Exactly. Day. Yeah. But I try to do that as an example Yeah. to say, you know, God's provided enough through the church that I don't need to be charging stuff. And, exactly. I, and I think people like to see that because my generation has grown up with church leaders who it's all about the money. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we love, there's five offerings during a sermon and yeah. give this money, give that money. And it's like, no, uh, we're doing it for the Lord. And if you want to give, please give. But, you know, I can say to this moment, I have not received one donation. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't ask for them. I don't exactly. have anywhere on the website that says give me money yeah. because that, that's not what it's about. Obviously, our ministries are different. Mm -hmm. Yours is getting materials to people, where yeah. thankfully mine's all digital, so I don't need to do that. Yeah, but uh, but just to agree one hundred percent with yeah. you, we're having a thousand copies provided in India, um, the Telugu uh, language. Ninety six million people speak thousand copies, and people go, "Oh, what are, what are you making off?" And the reality is nothing. nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Yeah. We don't take a salary. Mm -mm. We just want to get out truth. So it's, we're grateful our church provides for us. And as long as we have that, you know, we can stay focused and just churn out this material. Uh, but it's it, it's all about getting this uh -huh. out to train others because it's our calling. Important. So yeah. All right. I think on that note, we'll go ahead and wrap it up around the forty minute mark. A little okay. under. Try yeah. to keep these podcasts under that. Yeah. Because we were talking that. If we did all of this chapter, <laughs> we'd be uh, going on a two-hour podcast. Not by this. the uh, clock, <laughs> but by the calendar. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> we'll go ahead and wrap that up, and we'll see you Very next good. time. That's good.